Uh, dear Lord, thank you for this time that we have to come together. We pray that you would bless this time, uh, that we could uh, learn from one another, uh, and that you would uh, use Emma and I to help uh, present something new, a new idea, and that it could uh, benefit these teachers. Amen. Amen. All right, so if you guys have any questions, I mean, this is a small group, so you can just raise your hand or blow them out, but if you don't, if you want to be anonymous, then you can scan that with your phone. And then we'll pull up like questions at the end to answer as well. So, so I'll just to go over some of the things we're going to talk about um, is just introduce ourselves more, talk about why we um, sought out Daily Five, what it is, um, what Daily Three is. If you're interested in the math version of it, and then getting how to get started and how to learn more as well. So. All right. So we have some questions. Just curious how your school year has been so far. Uh, this is our cat Oats. So. One, uh, perhaps you're still slowly waking up on your bed. It's a little tired, barely making it. This one, she's a little bit halfway there, maybe. Uh, a little more playful in this one. Uh, pretty wide-eyed, happy, excited, ready to go. Uh, or, I don't know, that, oh, that one, look at her. She's getting down to work. So I don't know. <laughs> one to five. Which one would you relate to, my <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Back and forth, maybe, too. Uh, and this is just since the school year has been going. She doesn't like it when we're not home as much, so. Uh, so, you want to go ahead first? Yeah. So, um, I graduated from Concordia, Chicago in 2015 with elementary education. And then I took a call to Manuel Lutheran, taught second grade there. I graduated in December, so a year and a half of teaching there. And then as we graduated, we moved to Topeka Lutheran School and taught there the last five years. And then this past school year, we took a call to the Phoenix area at Christ Greenfield. And I also just finished my master's in educational administration at Concordia, Nebraska. All right, and I'm Isaac. I'm uh, we from the Chicagoland area originally. Uh, we met at Concordia, Chicago. Um, early childhood uh, is my major. Uh, with the ELL endorsement. I did five years teaching kindergarten uh, at Topeka, and now I'm doing first grade uh, at Christ Greenfield in Gilbert, which is about a half hour away from here. Right, so first I'm going to tell you, Daily Five is not something that like, we created. Um, it's something based off of um, the books um, created by Gail Boucher and Joan Moser. And so they've created second editions of the book as well. You can find it on Amazon. I've seen it at Barnes & Noble also. Um, and then the cafe book kind of goes with that. But if you are interested in getting started with it, this is kind of like, we'll give you a little intro to it, but if you really want to do it, you're going to want to read the book um, for sure. Yeah. So um, just this is, and I think some of you already answered this in the survey, maybe if you had done that, kind of your uh, experience with Daily Five. So kind of hard to tell if this is, though these are her, my dogs, dogs mostly, so from <laughs> in St. Louis. So, uh, but what are you guys at on this with experience of daily five? Okay, so a little mostly new for. You're using it. Version of it. Okay. Yeah. It's the same, like version. Of it. Yeah. I right. think that's how that's what we kind of talked about. Like I've never, it's never the same in anyone's classroom. So. Awesome. Would someone like to read this quote from the creator? Sure. I want, every, I want what every teacher wants, effective teaching methods that can adapt as things change and to lead our children to a lifetime of learning. Gail Bushi. So that was a quote from the creator and like they were teachers themselves and they thought like this need of how am I going to meet one-on-one -on -one with students, how do I have the time to meet in small groups effectively. Um, and so that's why she and her sister created that. Yeah. And part of the reason, too, why we sought out Daily Five, or you originally, um, was trying to figure out that timing uh, as a teacher with all your, you know, all the things you have to do. When do you have time for one-on-one -on -one instruction, uh, doing small groups? Like, how do you really capitalize on your time as a teacher to make sure that you are teaching effectively, but also giving your uh, students uh, a big part of it is a lot of free choice. Um, that isn't busy work but is actual independent work where they're working towards building their reading and writing skills, and then as a teacher gives you that time to uh, meet with them at the more individual level. 
Uh, and Daily Five kind of helps meet those needs. So we wanted to kind of survey where you guys think you are. So if you have your phone, we're going to take that out and scan this. Um, and there's like just little different things to write in there. It's anonymous, so feel free to be honest um, as much as you want. And then it will show like where we all are. Same one. So where's everyone from? Under focus. Nebraska. 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 Okay. Minnesota. 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 Whoops, sorry. It probably happens all the time. Now because we never go. Well, at least when you visit somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. No? Yeah. We have no accents. <laughs> we have an accent. I don't know what people are talking about. Yeah. I'm from Missouri. <coughs> I'm from Wisconsin. Wisconsin? <coughs> I didn't. What? You only grabbed the one tap. Okay, so then this takes everything that you guys said and then puts it into like an average. So, did you want to do that? Sure. Um, oh, pretty evenly split between all of this. Uh, so, you guys actually looking pretty good, feeling pretty confident about being able to work with students independently, uh, that your students love reading. I'm curious about, yeah, I don't know. I'm excited to see what you guys do too. Just I always love more ideas also on how you find that time to work with students to work independently and meet independently. So. But we'll get into what Daily Five does and how that helps to provide that time as well. Um, so Daily Five helps meet these needs. Um, the one-on-one -on -one time for instruction, effective small group instruction, um, time for students to work and read independently, pretty much everything you did on that survey. Uh, Daily, Daily Five uh, is a, it's a, like a structure for how you would do your reading, uh, your ELA block that uh, gives you the time to do and to meet all these different needs. So, well, if you're wondering what is Daily Five, um, a liter it's a literacy framework, like Isaac was saying, that instills behaviors of independence, it creates highly engaged readers, writers, and learners, and it provides teachers with the time and structure to meet the diverse, diverse needs of students. And so during Daily Five, the students are able to choose, there's five different choices, so we're going to get into that more as well, um, but working on reading and writing, and they're like really, it's really teaching them that independence, so that gives you the freedom to work one-on-one -on -one with students, um, or work in small groups, however you do that. Um, and what's great about Daily Five is like whatever reading curriculum you have, like you can use Daily Five with that, it's not its own thing. So I've taught it three, or used three different reading curriculums, and it's worked with all of them. So. Yeah, so Daily Five is not a reading curriculum in and of itself. Uh, it's not sensors, it's not busy work. Um, it's also not a one-size-fits-all approach, which is some of you have already said, you're kind of doing your own version of it. And even the creators say that's, they, they kind of created this with some of that flexibility that you can make it work for your classroom. Because uh, all our 
classrooms or schools and just the time and structure of your day is so much different from uh, you know class to class. Um, and it's also not a huge financial uh, or big time investment. So the start just kind of like in the this is in the book as well, but talking about like different degrees of like seat work, centers, workshop model, and then like daily five is more focused on like student driven, high student engagement. There's many choices, which you know when you give your students choices, they're way more motivated. Um, and it's authentic reading and writing because it's what they're really interested in. So, so five choices are read to self, work on writing, read to someone, word work, and listen to reading. So you say like three of those are reading focus, one's writing, and one's word work, which is like vocabulary or spelling. Um, and so one mi big misconception is you're probably like, I don't have time for that. Um, so there's five choices, but they're not doing all five like every day. They get to choose from those five choices. So some teachers have maybe wrap time for to do two every day, like two rounds is what it's called. Um, I've sometimes done three or four, depending on your schedule, so. All right, so we'll talk about read to self first. These are some pictures from uh, her classroom, actually. Uh, so the says here, the best way to become a better reader is to practice each day with a good fit book uh, that the students actually get to select themselves. And what, especially if you do get the Daily Five book, they have all these mini lessons to help really introduce a lot of the concepts and to help build up their stamina and to so you'll you start with read to self and um, you talk about really just the best practice uh, best practices for the for students to utilize so that they can you know find a good spot in the room and so we have lots of different kind of seating options in the classroom and you start off you know kids get to try out different spots and then they see like, ah, oh, that one didn't work for me, and then the next day they try to and eventually they get to choose where they're gonna sit. And that's a big part of Daily Five is lots of choice, but also helping them find and figure out what is a good fit book. You know, a book that's not too simple, but also not so challenging that they're becoming frustrated with it, but that they can read it, and just by, you know, spending that time in that book every day, uh, that they're gonna continue to grow as readers. Um, and stamina, yes, in kindergarten. So I've done this for the past five, well, six years now I'm doing it in first grade, but I've done it in kindergarten for the past five years. Uh, and it's always exciting because we, you do, you also track students' stamina for reading. And uh, it's always like a, they want to, because you'll, the way it works is you would say, okay, we're going to get in our spot to settle down. Say, I'm going to start a timer. We'll read and see how long we can go. But as soon as there's a distraction, you know this or that. I'm going to pause the timer. We'll re re regroup, talk about what went well, and then we come up with strategies for next time. We go back out and try it again. You kind of repeat this pattern the first couple of days, weeks of school. Um, but it's always fun because you know that first time you do, you sit down with a bunch of kindergartners and they all have their own books and they're all sitting in their own spots. And you get about 20 seconds in, <laughs> and then I, I get my rain stick. And Okay, hey guys, that was great. Let's come back and let's talk about what went well. Why do you say what you notice? And oh, we were talking. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's. What are we going to do next time? Oh, ignore distractions. This and that. And you chart it and write down your ideas. Um, usually within two to three days, my kindergartners uh, they go for, like they just they get excited about it and they're trying to beat that goal at that time. Usually we're up to 15 minutes by the third day of daily five uh, where they can sit as kindergartners picking their own spots with a good fit book, uh, which at that point, especially the beginning of the year, is really a good, uh, enjoyable picture book or something like they can you know, read through the pictures. Um, but they can sit there for 15 minutes with a book and they're engaged and they're excited about it. Uh, and that's kind of the beginning. That Those are those steps where now my kids are engaged with a book. This, I, it starts to, you can see how it starts to lay that groundwork where now I have that time frame to pool kids or to go to them and meet with them individually or in small groups. And there's more to it than just the reading. Um, like we said, all, every choice is very authentic in what they're doing as well. So same with work on writing. So you have like your own writing curriculum or whatever you're doing like instruction. This is like separate from that. So it's giving students time to just write about whatever they want to. Um, and so depending on younger grades, maybe it's drawing a picture and writing one sentence. In third grade, it looks more like, hey, we're not drawing pictures till later, like write first. Um, but it's just, just, it's just awesome to see like how exciting they are to like write their own stories and not have, you know, you have to have this and, you know, not worried about punctuation, like not grading it 
and so it's really their journal, um, and if they want to show me it, they can, but it's like, it's their space to just be creative and not to work Yeah. And they love, my kids, they love work on writing and come up with stories, and then I also make sure to take, take time in between rounds to like have kids share their stories too, uh, which they enjoy being able to do. Um, the other one is read to someone, which we also <coughs> love getting to uh, pick a partner and read with them. Uh, and again, you, you give them all the strategies and tools and techniques of how to find a partner, or where to sit, how to sit. We talk about, um, it's called eek, it's elbow to elbow, knee to knee, book in the middle so we both can see. Um, we talk about taking turns as we're reading. Um, but then also, there's options of like, you, you tell them, like, hey, you could read the same book and take turns, or, you know, you pick the book you want, your partner picks the book they want, and you just still are taking turns reading, but then you're also having them ask questions. We always talk about, like, uh, who and what was this page about, and they do a little check, you know, for understanding, and they should be asking each other about the book to work on that comprehension piece as well. Um, and then also, as they're reading, you teach them uh, to ask each other, if a kid is struggling with a word, you say, they can ask each other, hey, do you need coaching or time? And uh, you give them the strategies to kind of help them. And we always talk, like I talk to my kids, you know, they're all in t-ball or whatever sports they're in. And it's like, your coach come in and just like swing the bat for you? No, you gotta, he's going to give you the tools so that you can do it yourself. And that's what you get to do. If your friend needs a coach, you don't just read the word. You say, oh, well, I notice, you know, this diagraph for this thing or that, and then you give, you know, so you teach them how to work through it with their friends and give them the tools, um, or just time. I just need a little time. Um, but giving them those tools so, again, it's, it's authentic, they're really reading through it, they're engaged in it, they're asking each other about it, and uh, yeah, so working on their comprehension to get you to do it as a friend. And also, if you do have because they choose their partner, so you could have a low reader with a high reader, and the low reader also has that opportunity to hear a good model of reading, uh, which is really beneficial. Um, word work can, this one's probably the most like flexible, what you want it to be or how you want to use it. Um, in my classroom, it's like we practice our spelling words this way, and so um, there's different like manipulatives that they can use. It's like letter tiles or on a whiteboard. Um, I have some of these like on like worksheets, but it's like their choice of like, there's so many different things they can choose from how they want to practice their words. Um, they also talk about like, you could use this more for vocabulary if you have older kids, or depending on how you want to do it. Um, but the book kind of gives you more of those ideas. Yeah, and I'll say one of my things I do, especially with younger kids, to make sure that this is as authentic as it can be, is I actually, we've been blessed, we've been able to use iPads or computers in both our schools. Um, and there's awesome online programs. One of my favorites is called Splash Learn. They have math and reading games. It's totally free. Parents can even have access at home. Um, but I like using Splash Learn for work. <coughs> they love feeding on computers. But also, because that for me is one way to ensure that it's authentic word work practice. That because it's a game where they're building words and it's checking if they're doing it right or wrong. You know, whereas if they're working independently, they could just be playing with tiles, especially younger grades. And so for me, utilizing technology in that way has been a helpful way to ensure that it's authentic and in there. Splash only goes up, the reading part only goes up to second grade. Right? That is true, so. yes. But there's lots of programs similar uh, if you were to search. Um, but that's one of the tools I utilize. Um, and then there's listen to reading. And this one, now this could be uh, if you still have, you know, your book and cassette and you got your little reading uh, or a little listening station. Uh, that's pretty much what this is. Um, are you guys familiar with Epic? Okay, it's like, a, like the Netflix of books for kids and it reads to them. It's awesome. Also totally free for teachers. Um, that's a cool program and that's what my kids use uh, and your kids also for listen to reading because it's a whole library of books. They can find ones they're interested in, and it'll read the stories to them. Uh, and it even highlights the words as it's reading. So it's really, really neat program. Um, but that's what it, again, it's listening to those fluent readers, though, right? And that's a big, that's really helpful in uh, them being able to grow as readers, is hearing fluent readers. So this chart is also featured in their book, but it shows like the power, even if you only have time, 10 extra minutes every day, 
um, to do like one round of read to self or any exposure to reading. So like a student in the 50th percentile, let's say they normally get four and a half minutes of reading every day, they're exposed to 280,000 words per year. If you increase that by 10 minutes every day, like the jump is 200% more exposure to words and vocabulary. So just so powerful, even if you only have 10 minutes, um, like that's, I just started with deer time before I had David Five. You guys, that's all I had as a kid, but I just think that's like so powerful for them to be so sick. Yeah, and I actually, I even pulled this chart out with one of my first graders. I got a message from mom about how he was just really struggling to read at home, wasn't interested, and, which is, at school he's like, usually chooses read to self a lot actually, and loves to sit down with the books, but for whatever reason at home he wasn't. I even like, I pulled this chart out with my first grader, and he doesn't fully understand it, but I was just like, when you start spouting off really big numbers like that, they're like, do you know you could read like 1,429% more like words in like just by, and it was like, what? So then we like, I sent home a stamina tracker like we would use in class that now he's working to build his stamina at home also and then trying to get up to reading more. So getting him excited for it too. So I'm going to show you, um, there's a website too, like all the five resources and you can like see everything in action. So this video kind of shows like a daily five in action in one of these classrooms. So not ours, but ours. Um, so I just want to see like what do you notice is happening, and then we'll ask you guys to like share. you guys notice or questions or just like what do you notice or wonder? The kids are engaged doing they all had something they were doing and they were doing it. You was like where the students are too and like mm -hmm. it was kinda of all over the classroom. It's not confined to the like their desk or anything. Mm -hmm. What about like where this where the teacher was? Like, that's the one thing I thought was, like, so, like, I have, like, my U table in my classroom and a small group, like, the kids come to me, but, like, the concept of, like, you go to the kid, like, if they're reading a book and you want, like, you go sit with them on the floor, pull a chair or whatever, but kind of a cool way to think about mm -hmm. it. So the daily five essential elements, and this is what you would go through when you're reading the book, and then also just like this is like if you're going to launch daily five, these are like the key pieces. Um, so understanding, so basically uh, exploring the research behind daily five. Uh, you can do this through the books. Their website has lots of cool resources also, um, and understanding the like how the purpose and philosophy align together. Uh, to ensure longevity and that it's, it's going to work. Uh, and I'd say this is a really key piece is like, you know, it, like with anything, you're not really going to get behind it unless you understand the why of how it works, right? So if you try to just jump into it but you don't really get it, uh, it might not work out quite as well as you had hoped and it might even end up failing. Um, and so, so I think the people who have, like, I find it most successful, like, if you're passionate about it, mm -hmm. like, we, at our old school, our principal, like, saw, like, how passionate we were and was like, we all have to do this, and, like, made everyone get the training, and then, like, the people who are like, why do I have to do this, or, like, this doesn't work. I was like, well, if you don't want it to work, like, you have to be invested in it yourself, so definitely, like, don't go back tomorrow or whatever, Tuesday, and start trying to do, like, you really have to put the, like, foundation behind it mm -hmm. before because it, it 
they can flop. Like my first two years of trying, I was like, this isn't work. Like I was like ready to give up, but it just took a lot of time to like, I don't know, like the summer, really like read the book or do. There's like um, conferences you can. Yeah, we went to a conference and that helped a lot yeah. too. Okay, then the next step once you understand that is like setting up your classroom to have those like spaces for kids to go. Um, for us, it was like, you know, finding, growing to garage sales and like finding weird furniture places. Like my classroom has so many nooks and crannies that kids can go. Um, it just helps them like feel cozy and like, you know, they're more motivated to do um, their learning that way. And then also acquiring all those materials mm -hmm. that they want to use. But once you have that, like, that's the difference between like daily five and centers is like, constantly having to change out your centers with daily five once you've taught it like the materials that you teach them at the end of the year that's all you're using the whole year so that's kind of nice yeah to um and it's uh, they really do even just reading through the book like classroom design the portion in the book that talks about classroom design and they have some neat videos uh just it's another one of those like it's so intentional and sometimes can be so easily overlooked of like how important the setup of your classroom is to creating that environment for kids to really uh, feel that, like, well, feeling at home is a big part. Like, they have, they even talk about, like, you know, setting up lamps and uh, putting in, you know, portraits, you know, family pictures and stuff, and just making it feel homey so they they feel relaxed and, and creating, yeah, intentional nooks and crannies and spaces for them to go to and read in and be a part of. Um, and then the next step is teaching it. So. Um, learning the instructional movements. <laughs> so there's, they have their, you know, once you're teaching it, they have their guidelines of like, you know, these are the mini lessons you should teach and the, these are the prerequisites before you launch it. They should mean, you know, this much time of stamina in that specific task. And the other thing is, as you're teaching it, you're, you, you're not like, you don't do it all at once. You start with read to self and you build up your stamina until they're consistently reading to self, and then you introduce the next choice. Um, and then you focus on that first, and you would focus on that next choice until they build up the stamina. But now that you have stamina for both read to self and um, let's see what they work on writing, then you'd say, hey, we, we built up the stamina, now it's your choice. When I call your name, you're gonna make your choice. What are you gonna work on? Where, what space in the room are you gonna work? Like they get to then, Start having that ownership. I think it takes like, yeah, it takes at least like a month. It does take time. Like, okay, it runs itself. Mm -hmm. So it is like the beginning of the year. Every year you have to like start over. Like okay, but I think once like you do it right, it's just amazing. Like where we are now, it's like okay, everybody knows what we're doing. All the time, tell me their choice after recess, and like we're already just doing our own thing. So it's awesome. Um, and then like once you have it implemented, we're continuing to like monitor stamina. Like, kind of the way it works is like, you aim for like 10, 15, 20 minutes for each round, but like, if you notice like, if we're off track, like, the round's over, and then you come back, and we'll talk about that kind of structure, um, and then if there's like, you know, everyone has those few students in your class that are like, is this really gonna work for them? And so there's a little more intentionality with those students, and there's um, strategies with that in the book and website as well. So if you're wondering, how does this work? When do you do it? So um, everybody does it different. Like my first year, we just did like three round, like three of those rounds, like back to back. Um, but then I think we got to the conference and it like clicked. Like how much this is based on brain research is that, so they studied that your number of age and years is equal to the number of minutes your brain can like focus before you start being distracted, but it like caps off at like 10 minutes, so you guys are probably already not listening anymore. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so like a five-year-old in kindergarten, like you've got five minutes and then they're not gonna need it anymore. Um, so are my third graders like nine, I got nine minutes. So it's like breaking up your your reading curriculum um, and then putting daily five into that. So in my classroom, it's like, we're gonna re do our reading lesson and like kind of some comprehension questions, and then we're gonna break, and everyone's gonna do daily five. And then after we come back, and then we do like our reading skill, or worksheet, or graphic organizer, and then we break, and then they do daily five. And then we come back, and then we do like our writing for the day. And so it's like, instead of we're just sitting in our desk for an hour, an hour and a half, it's breaking it up with that. And so that's what's showing you the gray, or the dark blue bar is like your lesson, and then daily five in between that. And so those are the daily five choices. And then while students are doing that, the cafe book talks more about like, what are you doing with the students? Um, so if you already have like guided reading or whatever you like, 
you've already got a system, you don't really need that. But if you're interested, CAFE really helped me like understand what can I be doing with students individually or guided reading groups and assessing in that way too. Yeah, and I know a lot of reading curriculums have, um, especially now, built-in small group activities and things. And that's the kind of stuff that like really you could take, that's why it could work with any reading curriculum because you can take that curriculum and all you're doing is breaking it into more manageable chunks, giving your students some independence and free time um, to work on their skills individually. Um, but then it gives you that time to work in those small groups or to do those different activities with the students. So yeah, while students are working, then you can meet with students one-on-one, -on -one. you can do your guided groups or other small group activities, you can assess students, and then usually within one session, like you can meet with two small, up one to two small groups or three to four students. So yeah, it's like quick, you're not spending that whole 15 minutes, like three, five minutes checking in with that student and then they're back to that, and then you're moving on to the next student, so. All right, so then this was also like a huge aha moment for us when we went to the conference. They showed this video of like how teachers meet with their small groups. Um, I had, my first school, like we had the guided leaders in like the three different levels and on level below, all that. I just felt like it wasn't effective. I felt like one student would just like say all the answers, like, okay, I hope you're all thinking that. Like, I just feel like it wasn't effective. And so seeing this was like, a huge aha moment for me. So just notice like the teachers pulled their group by their skill, which I think is becoming more common now, um, like best practice. Um, and so they each have their own book that's fit to their level at the same time. So I just wanted you to see like how she does this. And you won't watch the whole thing. to get me today because we're going to be talking about a strategy, but before we begin that strategy, I'd like to think listening in on to your kind of reading, so could you just read to me a little bit out of your good fit book? Mm -hmm. I want you all to read at the same time, just whisper read. Mm -hmm. We are going to practice a particular strategy together. You all are, are going to be working on recognizing literary elements. And this is a strategy that you know, we've talked about in full group, but you're going to be concentrating on your own. Um, when we think about our literary elements, I like to use a graphic organizer. It helps me keep all the elements kind of straight in my head and what I need to be looking for. So today, as we're reading, we're going to think about the main characters in our story the setting of our story, the problem, different story events, and the resolution. And you guys are all in different books, and you're all in different places in your book. So it might be that you don't find the problem in your story, or you may already know that problem in your story. You might not have all the story events unless you're getting ready to finish your book. You probably will not have the resolution. So just to kind of give you like a peek into like how that works, because they say, they talk about this in the book, but like reading like, how can three kids be reading at the same time, different books out loud, like that's not gonna work. But I mean, they're focused on what you're reading, and so she's taking notes on like, what is she noticing, or like how they're reading, she's writing down what page are they on, what book are they reading, and then they're all able to like authentically apply their book to what they're learning, and what they need in that moment. So I don't know, has anyone else already done this, or like, what do you guys think about? I do it with uh, my first graders even, and I did it with my kindergartners, and you know, my first graders are reading a lot of what I'm looking for is, um, and they, they'll all read quietly, you can you could tune in to one kid specifically and hear what they're doing, uh, it's not that tricky, and then also like, 
I usually, I actually take a pencil <coughs> in their books, um, but usually I'll do that if they come to like something really challenging. Go, oh, that's a big multi-syllable word. Let's break that up. Let's look find the vowel. And I'll give them, like, say, like, let's find the vowels. Let's find, you know, and we do we'll talk through it or we'll look for diagraphs or things and we'll kind of mark words. I, this is what I do, is I'll mark words for them uh, or have them mark the words so that they can then have that tool. Um, so it's just, again, giving them as they're reading, as they're working through it, you can tune into each kid and kind of work with them on those specific strategies and skills that they're working on so that they can apply it in their independent reading. Right, so now we're going to get into Math Daily 3. So does anyone ever use, ever use Math Daily 3 at all? Attempting. Yeah, that's a, I ended up not using, like, I really love our reading curriculum to pace so well that I don't actually use Math Daily 3, but yeah. Isaac, yeah, oh, Math yeah. Daily 3, but Isaac does. So, anyways, the three choices are very similar um, and same kind of concepts, so if you're looking for something to kind of break up your math, like, lesson time, um, it is definitely, like, awesome. So, math by myself, math writing, and then math with someone. Yeah. Well, I was going to, sorry, I was going to yeah. say. I actually don't use Math Daily 3 enough right now. I use pieces of it still, um, but I did use it with our last curriculum, uh, or one of the, I don't even remember what it was at this point. I just, was, it was not a very, like the curriculum itself was not designed in a way that it was like, like we're just in a, oops, we were in a workbook a lot, and it was just not very engaging or hands-on, and so this was an opportunity for me to like break up that math lesson into what was also a lot of teaching. Um, but not as much like independent or small group. Sure. Just I feel like our math curriculum now like has these. Yeah. It. So it's kind of up to you, but it's in the it's in the daily five book if you're curious about yeah. part two. Um, all right. Yeah. So the, it's pretty similar idea. So there's math by myself, which is doing um, certain math activities. Maybe you have math games or things they could do independently. Again, I use uh, Splash Learn because that has a math piece to it. Um, so they're engaged in games where they're practicing math skills. The cool thing with Splash Learn is I can also assign specific, like by the standard, what are we learning? I can assign them those uh, skills. And I still utilize uh, this piece for sure. Now so more as a, uh, like when we're done with our work, we can do math by myself. Um, is how I utilize it now. Um, and then there's math writing. This one kids actually have a lot of fun with, especially um, my little kids. They like coming up with challenging math problems for me to solve. But my challenge back to them is you have to be able to solve it as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they're create. really what they're doing is they're coming up with like word stories. And they're like, they are taking the kind of examples they see in their math books and they're creating their own forms of it and working through that. Or, writing through math problems um, and so it's just a fun way for them to kind of engage with math uh, but yeah a little bit more on that like independently um, and a little bit more authentic to them uh, and then there's math with someone which of course they love and this is if you have uh, certain math games or activities um, the <coughs> one math curriculum I had like it had a lot of these games as you introduce lessons it would have these games and so I would use those and pull them out for the kids to do math with someone. Um, but similar to, it kind of depends on what the skills and strategies are. You know, like with the word work games, you're always working with letters. So you're always, you know, you could have magnets and you can have the same set of tools. With math games, there's all sorts of different concepts that you're working through. But generally, you know, dice, uh, counters, different manipulatives like that. And then you have these resources available that the kids could work with a partner and do games in uh, with each other. But again, working through math uh, with their partners um, in a fun, authentic way. So um, is anyone interested in seeing like this teacher just talks about like the different math choices and stuff? Anyone's interested? Keep going. <laughs> so, well, the slideshow we're hoping, I think we're going to be able to put it on the app so you can pull up all of this stuff too if you want to go back and watch it as well. But um, it's a similar structure. So, if you like the way I was, if I were going to use it, like, um, you know how like you have the I do, we do, you do part of your lesson. So, kind of like breaking that up. 
Um, and so I've used like elements of it where it's like, okay, I notice like these few kids are really not getting it. So then, like, okay, we're gonna break and like I did this last week. Like, okay, everyone go to splash learn, and then I just pulled those kids aside, and then while everyone else is working on like whatever their math daily three choice, then you can like work with that small group and kind of catch them up, um, so they're not feeling like behind before the lesson's already over. Yeah. So uh, just one of the ways, like again, you can kind of adapt it. One of the ways I even adapted it. Um, was I had learned, at least with the curriculum we had, and just, again, was not as engaging. I was like, teaching a class of a bunch of kindergartners all at the same time is really hard in math, because you have kids who are way up here, and kids who are way down here, and the kids who are way up here want to race ahead, and the kids who are way down here, they don't, they're struggling to keep up, and you want to meet their needs, but you got to, and so it's like, how do you, so the way I kind of adapted it was I would say, okay, we're going to do round one. I'm going to meet with this group of students to teach the lesson while you make your choice. Read, you know, math by myself, math with someone, <coughs> or uh, math writing. And then I would work with my small group and teach the lesson in a small group. And then we'd jump to the next round. Okay, now you guys make your choice, now I'm going to work with this small group. And it just made it a lot more manageable, um, I felt like. So, again, it doesn't have to be... But it, it's figuring, some, with some of it, like the, in terms of setting it up and like the structure that the students will use, like that's really important. But as far as kind of how you can still definitely make lots of adaptions uh, to make it work best for your classroom. So if you're wondering, how do I get started? Um, or what sets days I'm apart? And then why you might want to get started. Um, the students are engaged in reading and writing for extended periods of time. Um, they receive explicit focus instruction that then builds their independence. So like when, I, when like my principal walks in there and they're like, oh, it's so quiet, it's so calm. Like everyone's doing what they're supposed like most of everyone's doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, like yeah, it's just like well, I mean yeah, I taught them that, but really like they've taken ownership of that, and so just awesome to see that independence and responsibility. Um, and then it's differentiated. Students are reading their own good fit level books, like for themselves. Um, and I'm able to work with small groups to meet everybody's needs or individual needs. And then students are accountable for what they're learning as well. This is uh, the, so it's the opposite side. They, yeah. they work together. <laughs> this is what the students are doing, and that's all the things you're explaining what the teacher gets to do with the students while they're working in it. Anyone want to read this quote? <coughs> sure, I can do that. Thanks. <laughs> like we ask all students to do the same learning task in the same way. We have no idea what individual children are capable of. Uh, and, oh, this quote, I don't know, this, is a, this is from one of the, from Gail Boucher maybe, but choice has been identified as a powerful force that allows students to take ownership and responsibility in their learning. Um, when you give that those kids, when you give your kids the choice and you know the choice of where to work, what they're working on, what skills are they, and even it gets into that. Especially you do look into the daily cafe, which is what can you do with students. It's also like they're gonna like what strategy do you think you need to focus on? What skills can you work on? What can you build up? And and so then you're all like this. They're giving them this control, and they take ownership over what they're doing and learning. Uh, and it's, it's just a really powerful tool just to give them that choice. And again, it's very structured, but they get that choice, and uh, it's pretty powerful. Right, so like I said, I recommend reading the books. Uh, Amazon or Barnes & Noble probably have those. And then the website, there you can get like three free articles, I think, every month. But then there's like a chart. I don't think it's very much, like annual thing. Um, but some of the, there's some articles that are free, so I would just recommend looking at that because um, there's just so many like there's different Q and A's and like there's videos to watch. There's work like those graphic organizers that you saw her using. Like you can print those things. There's like stuff you can send home to parents um, and like all the research there. We also created a Facebook group that has like a thousand people in it. So if you wanna like add join the support <coughs> group at all, um, you can click on the link once we send the slide out. But um, just, like, if you have any questions and you want to contact, like, usually I try to respond to people in that as well. But, yeah. So a minute, a minute. <laughs>
So this is um, one of the creators like interviewing a teacher who like started using it. So Miss Campbell, we're in your fifth grade classroom with I must say some of the most outstanding fifth graders I think I've seen. <laughs> with the best teacher, I think. But you have, you are only a second year teacher. Mm -hmm. And we have been in here seeing the magic that you're doing. <laughs> um, what advice would you give other teachers who are just starting out with Daily Five or Cafe or both? Um, what has helped you get some of those things up and going? I think reflection. Reflection is the key, really, to any type of success. You have to try things and you have to be brave and you have to know that it's okay if you fail. Um, these guys are super supportive and my class last year was super supportive and if I fail in front of them I'm not teaching them that that to not take risks. I'm teaching them to take risks and so I need to try new things and I need to experience new things and then reflect on that and say what did work. Let me take what did work away from that and let's try it again and keep trying. Um, for new teachers, I would say just don't be afraid to try something. Don't be afraid if it doesn't work. Just keep looking for your niche. Everybody has their way, and Daily Five and Cafe do such a great job of allowing teachers to take a great structure and a research-based structure and then expand that into our own teaching styles. And it gives us room to grow and room to work within it, but it also gives us those research-based strategies to go back to that are going to support what our students need. And, and overall, you can't go wrong with that.